without any further ado, I would like to introduce El Marcus, National Chairman of the National Caucus of Labor Committees, author of the textbook Dialectical Economics, out of the groundbreaking paper Beyond Psychoanalysis and smaller companion papers which have appeared in recent weeks, which have introduced a revolution in psychological science. El Marcus. During a period of reaction which occurred among British intellectuals in the wake of the French Revolution, there was an attempt to explain creativity and art as being something which occurred within art itself as independent of political movements of that time. In rebuttal of this, uh, Shelley wrote an essay, one of his several important essays, and I'll refer to another one later tonight, entitled In Defense of Poetry. And I shall read a section from the conclusion of that, which is a thesis from which we shall work to provide a setting for the purpose of this program. The literature of England an energetic development of which has ever preceded or accompanied a great and free development of the national will, has arisen, as it were, from a new birth. In spite of the low-thoughted envy which would undervalue contemporary merit, our own will be a memorable age in intellectual achievements. And we live among such philosophers and poets as surpass beyond comparison any who have appeared since the last national struggle for civil and religious liberty. The most unfailing herald companion and follower of the awakening of a great people to work a beneficial change in opinion or institution is poetry. At such periods, there is an accumulation of the power of communicating and receiving intense and impassioned conceptions respecting man and nature. The persons in whom this power resides may often, as far as regards many portions of their nature, have little apparent correspondence with that spirit of good of which they are the ministers. But even whilst they deny and abjure, they are yet compelled to serve the power which is seated on the throne of their own soul. It is impossible to read the compositions of the most celebrated writers of the present day without being startled with the electric life which burns within their words. They measure the circumference and sound the depths of human nature with a comprehensive and all-penetrating spirit. And they are themselves perhaps the most sincerely astonished at its manifestations, for it is less their spirit than the spirit of the age. If Shelley's thesis is correct, that is that great periods of revolutionary transformation are heralded and accompanied by an intellectual renaissance, then the Bolshevik Revolution and the period following it is ironical. For the Bolshevik Revolution was preceded by approximately a quarter century of general decay, accelerated decay, of intellectual life in Europe and the United States, and has been followed by 50 years of accelerated decay in the arts. The situation in the sciences is not that much better. Uh, while there has been much elaboration, which is called fundamental advance in the physical sciences, so-called, there actually has been no breakthrough during the past 50 years, nor any sign of a new breakthrough in development but rather an elaboration of those achievements, the fundamental achievements, which were made in the first two decades of this century. There's been, of course, a rather revolution in biological sciences, but that again falls in the same category. Essentially, from approximately the end of the First World War, this has been a period of accelerated decay. And if Shelley's thesis is borne out, there must be some correlation between the intellectual decay of capitalist culture and world culture generally throughout the past 50 years, and the fact that there have not been heretofore successful socialist revolutions in the advanced sector. I would say that Shelley's thesis is correct, and that without an intellectual revolution, it will be impossible, perhaps not impossible, but extremely unlikely, that there will be a socialist transformation in the brief period left to us to do that. However, it's not quite so simple. We are, in fact, in the Labor Committee tendency, 
initiating an intellectual revolution. And the question of beyond psychoanalysis is essentially an attempt to get at the uh, lawfulness or the lawful processes by which we will accomplish this revolution. We are not concerned, except in a peripheral and secondary way, to deal with problems of psychoanalysis per se. What we're concerned to do is to get at certain lawful aspects of the human power for cognition in order to unblock those mental powers which are necessary if we're going to initiate and convey, uh, communicate the kind of intellectual revolution in progress. Is exactly what that is will become clearer in the course of the four lectures. This is not unprecedented. If one turns to the major works which preceded and followed the French Revolution, we'll find that this attention to examination of the laws of mind is by no means unprecedented. As I indicated in the article itself, the first systematic effort to deal with the lawful processes of cognition was undertaken by Descartes particularly in the two theorems which I cited, which I'll refer to again tonight. More significantly, the principal work of Kant was essentially psychological in its uh, purpose. That is, it was essentially psychological science. Hegel's phenomenology is nothing but a report of the laws of the mind itself as explored by one of the greatest creative thinkers of modern times, who used his exploration of his own mind as the means for developing his dialectical method, his phenomenology of mind. In the case of Hegel's immediate successor, Ludwig Feuerbach, the same applies. Feuerbach's essence of Christianity is as he professes it to be, an exploration into the laws of human thought, the laws of human mentation. What we are doing here, then, is to make a further exploration, in a sense, in the tradition of Descartes, in the tradition of Hegel, the tradition of Feuerbach, and also, though with less emphasis in Marx's case, the tradition of Marx. Now, what we shall do tonight is to concentrate on the question of the context, the grounding uh, within which we have to situate any attempt to establish a science of mind. However, before doing that, I shall just indicate some of the empirical features of the mind, uh, and so doing will enable us to refer to these things as we go along, and then I'll develop uh, these points in later lectures. If you examine the contents of your own mind, your own mental processes, you will discover with a minimum amount of analysis that there are essentially three accessible identities within your head. The first of these is a relic of infancy, which nonetheless is predominant, the predominant sense of self in most individuals in capitalist culture. It's the so-called ego which is more properly should be termed the infantile ego. This is the aspect of your identity which becomes clearest when you say, I sincerely feel that I must do this or I do this because I feel that this is true. It's the part of yourself which is immediately associated with immediate action uh, and is associated with three kinds of emotion. One of the types of emotion immediately char uh, characteristic of the infantile ego is simple infantile elation at object possession. And object possession to the ego includes possession of people. That is, the, the elation that a child feels in having its mother, its wife, its girlfriend around is simple elation of object possession. There's nothing very human about it. The second of these emotions is the emotion of infantile anger or rage. And this type of emotion is uh, what you are seeing manifest in uh, the work of logicians and mathematicians and so forth. The essential emotion of mathematics is infantile rage. 
And that is no exaggeration. Uh, as a matter of fact, this becomes clearest in chess play where there's a similar relationship. Across the board, chess play involves an emotion. The emotion is pure infantile rage. There is no human relationship between the opponents across the chessboard. The third emotion associated with the ego is infantile sense of fear or depression. And these three emotions are associated with the ego. Now there's another entity, a second entity to consider, which you can experience by, and Hegel describes this somewhat in the introduction and preface to the phenomenology of mind, but it's something you can get at very easily, that you can, in a sense, be conscious of what you are thinking. You can be conscious of the mechanisms or certain of the dynamics involved in understanding why you feel certain things. Rather than simply feeling something, you can be conscious that this feeling is generated in you in a certain way. You can, in a sense, come up behind your own back, the back of your mind, and see what you are thinking, see how you are operating. This sense, uh, this is self-consciousness. Now, self-consciousness, which in an adult or in adult society, which capitalist society is not, that is, in which human beings became adults and outgrew the infantile ego, the location of the sense of identity would be entirely located in this self-conscious self, which you can know empirically as that part of you which is able to look at what the other part of you is doing. In capitalist culture, in alienation, the self-conscious self is a rather weak creature emotionally. It, it generally does not know any emotions. It's simply a passive creature which is tolerated and utilized like a slave by the ego. It's used for thinking. I'll give an example. Some of you were exposed to a hideous experience which is called secondary school geometry. And in the U.S. that is a hideous experience. The pedagogy in the U.S. is, uh, well, I'll get to that later when I discuss a German medical examination, which is one of the most hideous things that can be done to a human being. But in U.S. geometry, you're drilled in the following way. You're given a theorem or a problem and the first thing you have to do is to develop a solution concept for this problem or this theorem. Then, that being a brief part of your classroom or related activity, if you're a typical U.S. secondary school, you go through the literally anal process of detailing a proof, detailed logical argument. Now, in this process, there are two phases. In the first phase, in getting at the solution concept, you access self-consciousness and get what you might regard as an intuition of a solution. You play with this intuition until you are virtually certain that at least as a hypothesis, this is a satisfactory solution. Then you turn your mind off and you get down to writing out the proof. There is no reflection in what you do for, the, for your grade in that class. There is no reflection of actual human mental activity. Because you do not reflect in what you write, you do not reflect the fact that you actually accessed your powers of reason and developed an intuition of a solution concept. What you report is simply the anal process of detailing this logical proof, something which is done in the ego state. Well, I'll go to that German thing. We had a problem in Germany, among our members there, that we found that we have a significant number of, of members who are medical students. It's a fluke which one, one of the individuals here is partly responsible for. And we found that as they had to take their examinations, they would take off for six to three months to prepare for an examination. Didn't make sense, not to me. Then we found that after having the examination, that the individual was in a poorer state of mind, in poor emotional health, it exhibited more acute neurotic symptoms, was less able to think than before taking the examination. Well, I was curious as to what had happened, and I found out when I got to Germany and dug into it with them. We did some sessions and found out the horrible things that had done to them. Now, the first thing about this three to six months period, 
was that during this period of three to six months, the people taking the examinations, that is, absenting themselves from politics and actually all other kinds of intellectual activity, had plenty of time to whore about and perform what would normally pass for students' recreations. But they were, precisely, all of their recreations were of the most banal and degraded sort. There was no real intellectual recreation, really bestialized forms of recreation. A number of them who went through this tried to do political work during the period that they were preparing for the examinations and found they could not prepare for the examinations. What was the reason for this? When you look at the content of the preparation for a German medical examination, it may not be much better here. I just know the case in Germany. I don't know the case in the United States. It's strictly drill. It's the, a more extreme version of the same kind of problem which you run into in preparing the geometry proofs in the secondary school in the United States. Now, the mind will not tolerate the kind of memory drill required to prepare for such an examination if your self-consciousness is turned on. It's too degrading. So what the student was doing in absenting himself from political work, and it wasn't just political work, it was any kind of intellectually stimulating activity. The student had to cut himself off from all intellectually stimulating activity and reduce his life to merely grinding and drilling in memory for this medical examination. And otherwise, keep himself on a fairly bestialized level in his social life and recreations. Then, of course, uh, it would come the end of this preparation process and go into a room generally put on by a suit for the occasion and go into a parlor-like room, a dozen or so or a half dozen of them, sit around with one or two examiners, two or three questions would be thrown at them out of the hundreds for which they had prepared themselves. And then the student would leave the room and would generally would be, uh, have a real letdown and begin to manifest rather acute neurotic symptoms as well as a general inability to do intellectual work. Well, we got into the depths of some of this stuff and in effect, the, if you begin pulling up, and I'll get into this later, if you begin pulling up uh, in analysis what had happened to these people, on the unconscious level, the effect was as if a, a large, more than slightly man-sized black beetle had performed sodomic rape on them. The ascent, in other words, there was an acute sense of degradation in going through this kind of experience. And then, as we got into this with some of the uh, physicians and medical students who'd gone through this process, we located a relationship between what is done to medical students in Germany and the sadomasochistic relationship between among doctor, nurse, and patient in the hospital. So in general, in capitalist life, people who have any kind of intellectual activity access their self-consciousness, that is their reason. They are somewhat aware of what they're doing, what the ego is doing but they're not able to do much about it. In the uh, article on the sexual impotence of the Puerto Rican Socialist Party, I outline this at, in some detail. In the case of the macho sexual pattern, an intelligent Latin American macho or Italian papagallo, which is a feathered macho, finds himself in the presence of a woman under certain kinds of relationships. And in, in these cultures, there's a Madonna whore pattern uh, which, to which women and men are both subjected. Is that when a man is playing the whore pattern as a papagallo or macho, he is often aware that this is a degrading thing. He's degrading himself, he's degrading the woman. She is playing the same game. She's being either a Madonna or a whore and is aware of her degrading role at the time she's performing it. Yet neither of them, though they are aware of this on a self-conscious level, are able to stop themselves from doing it. They're like an alcoholic. And the alcoholic says, I shouldn't be drinking all the time. The alcoholic has liquor in front of him, drinks it, gets drunk, says, I shouldn't be doing this, and afterwards said, I shouldn't have done it. But he still does it. His self-consciousness is not able to intervene to prevent the ego from, uh, from controlling his or her behavior. So that's the second entity, this self-consciousness, which in a healthy individual, that is what ought to be a human being, would be the, the location of the sense of identity. 
and then the ego. Now, this self-consciousness, the self-conscious I, is properly associated with a very special kind of emotion and its derivatives. I call this emotion the fundamental emotion. And we'll get to this a little bit tonight to qualify what it is. Normally, that is among alienated people who are looking at this emotion or experiencing it from the standpoint of locating their sense of self in the ego. This emotion is experienced as what is sometimes called an oceanic feeling. It's an overwhelming, intense feeling, which is usually experienced uh, as a religious experience. It's what happens to people when they get into these evangelical orgies. It's also experienced more rarely in what people often call an overwhelming feeling of non-erotic loving. Now, the reason they call it non-erotic, because people generally identify what they mean as erotic loving, as a sexual impulse associated with the elation of object possession. And they find that they, in this case, they are, they are experiencing an overwhelming feeling, which they identify as some kind of feeling of love, but they identify this as being different to, then, and opposed to the ordinary banal erotic feelings. This same emotion, this oceanic emotion, is sometimes experienced as a feeling of impending insanity or death. It's, it's sometimes known as the love-death emotion. Uh, in Freudian analysis, uh, nonsense is uh, perpetrated, uh, not as bad as, as Herbert Marcuse's version of it. Herbert Marcuse is a quack from all standpoints, both philosophy and analysis. But in an attempt to dichotomize this fundamental emotion, or this so-called oceanic feeling, and to report that there are two such emotions. One, an overwhelming feeling of love and a counterposed overwhelming feeling of death. They happen to be the same emotion. It's just the sense of love and death are experienced in, in different ways. For example, in an evangelical orgy, that is one of these fundamentalist uh, religious sects is having a revival, and in a Baptist sect, for example, or Methodist sect, and they get the people whipped up and they evoke this kind of alienated expression of this fundamental emotion, which comes over these people as an oceanic uh, swarm of intensity without shape and so forth, just a swarm. Or they feel it about to come. Now, here's where this trick of baptism is cute. Because of the nature of the emotion, it's easily identified with the ocean. That's why it's called oceanic. It's identified with water. The idea in these revival services, the idea in the mind of the individual that he or she is about to subject themselves to immersion in water helps the individuals to release this emotion. That's why baptism developed. This is a, an alienated experience of this type of emotion. However, in a more or less healthy individual, that is one who can locate the sense of identity in this in self-consciousness this emotion is experienced in in a less overwhelming manner it's experienced as a normal kind of emotion this emotion and its derivatives in which case it becomes the normal emotion of loving and also is the effective state which correlates with uh, creative thought there's a third entity of importance in this, in your mind, which in most cases in analysis would come up rather quickly as the image of a witch. This image is associated with the ego, that is, it's in direct relationship to the ego, and usually you will identify it with the mother. Now, the image of the witch is not, and we'll get to this a little later on the session, is not an image or a product of the existent mother, but is a product of alien, an alienated and infantile relationship between the infant and young child and the mother. And it's this, emo, it's this relationship which is alienated and distorted. Because the child has a dependency relationship on the mother which is established in infancy and continues really through early childhood, the mother image, of course, is the, most, is the dominant figure in the sense of infantile ego identity in the child and in the later adult. 
but because of the reflection of bourgeois relations in family relations, the image of the mother, or the image which is associated with the mother, is not a picture of the mother, and I'll qualify that in just a moment, usually comes forth as the witch. The belief in witches is a projection of this. Now normally, this witch image, and there's some others which I won't go into here, but the one can say that the uh, paintings of, and sketches of Bruegel, Bosch, and Goya, particularly Goya's dark period, were not inventions, but they were drawn from life. They represent the type of images which people will get very readily under extreme stress, in which the contents of their unconscious processes come into consciousness, or in analysis. These kinds of images come pouring out easily. The witch is a third category. Now, normally the witch is not able to take over the personality directly. However, in certain psychotic states, that is extreme disassociation, uh, the individual will find even the ego will be blocked from direct control of the person and some other person is controlling the behavior, directly or indirectly, the witch. So these are the three entities which we will primarily deal with and the emotions uh, in dealing with the mind. Our concern, as I've already indicated by this outline, our concern is to understand the fundamental emotion, to understand the problems of self-consciousness, and of course, from a clinical standpoint, to understand how to enable people to begin to make the transition from being alienated, people dominated by their infantile egos, into people who have more or less subordinated their infantile egos and have effectively located their sense of self in their self-consciousness. That is, in which the power to act, the power to control what the body does, is located in reason, in self-consciousness, in which this fundamental emotion is used to control the, uh, to activate what the body does, as opposed to the infantile egos, uh, rather banal and hideous, uh, greedy little infantile operation. I'll just make one reference to, again, to another essay of, of Shelley's on life. Shelley says this, let us recollect our sensations as children. What a distinct and intense apprehension we had of the world and ourselves. Many of the circumstances of social life were then important to us, which are, which are now no longer so. But that is not the point of comparison which I mean to insist. We less habitually distinguished all that we saw and felt from ourselves. They seemed, as it were, to constitute one mass. There are some persons who, in this respect, are always children, and so forth. That in my experience, that most people who have any talent as adults for creative activity generally had a fairly strong identification with this kind of fundamental emotion up until the time they were about two or three. And then in the process of stultification, they generally lost the connection with, uh, with this fundamental emotion and were increasingly reduced as they grew older to banalize creatures who are capable only of these three infantile emotions which I indicated earlier. That is, of sensing them. The fundamental emotion is always working in a distorted way, at least. But the, in terms of direct types of emotional behavior, only the three fundamental, or the three banal types of infantile emotion were experienced. This, uh, we, you get this in music in particular. Uh, for example, in Germany, in dealing with the problems of of sexual impotence among a group of extraordinarily talented people, not ordinary emotional imbeciles, but very talented people, that never had they experienced a deep and intense emotion related to the fundamental emotion, or like the emotion of, of Wagner's famous Liebestod duet. They never experienced that in a relationship with a person of the opposite sex never experienced it in a love relationship, had never experienced the emotion of love in a love relationship. But they had a weak feeling of love for a person. The minute they got, began to approach the bed, this banal feeling of infantile object possession took over. They behaved like a couple of animals and so forth. But they never experienced the emotion of love in a love relationship. They had experienced it weakly or otherwise in another location, in music. One of the few places that people experience this kind of emotion, normally. And we find it characteristic among musicians that early in childhood, 
up until about the time of puberty, they would approach music with a feeling of this kind of emotion, which they would begin to lose in puberty and would lose their real musical insight and would have to substitute their formal skills, virtuosity or whatnot, uh, to maintain themselves as musicians. They be had become, in effect, emotionally castrated musicians. Common problem in puberty, the loss of this emotion. So our concern is, is to locate, identify what this emotion is, and define its relationship to this creative process. All right, I should just review what, what I covered in the article in this respect. Is prior to capitalism, the emergence of capitalism, there was no positive conception of man as man. That in no culture prior to the emergence of capitalism is there a distinct positive conception of man as man. There are essentially religious feelings which reflect man's perception that he is qualitatively different from the animal. But man is unable to account for this. It's simply something he feels and believes and ferociously attempts to defend. But it's only with the emergence of capitalism that man has begun to discover a positive conception of man, that man is absolutely different from the beasts. This emerged, and I've used a concentrated uh, circumstantial uh, basis for explaining this, that is from approximately the middle of the 16th century into the middle or latter part of the 17th century. Europe went through an orgy of depopulation and misery in general, uh, which I'm afraid, if capitalism continues, we're on the verge of now, or the like of which we're on the verge of now. There was general depopulation, cannibalism, and so forth. Yet at the same time, in a number of centers, England one, the Low Countries another, certain parts of France another, and a few other pockets, there was a flourishing development, a flourishing material progress. Now in every case, as in the case of Tudor England, and under the Tudors, from the accession of Henry VII to about 1589, the Tudors and others expended fairly substantial sums for such tight wads on fostering uh, technology. In addition, the London merchants and others also contributed heavily to this. So that in the prosperity of England, and the prosperity of the Low Countries and other regions, there was a direct connection perceptible to all of the educated layers. A direct connection between the relative prosperity of these regions as against the misery of the others, and the fact that these regions were centers of invention. The invention not only in ordinary sense of technological inventions, but inventions in social and political forms. There was obviously a direct connection between creative innovations by individuals, innovations which, being actualized by the surrounding society, advanced that society. So men in that time discovered a connection between the necessity of his existence, that is, the misery of the world if you didn't make changes, if you tried to go on in the old way, the world collapsed. As opposed to the progress, the improvement of the human condition, which was associated with these innovations. Now, despite the fact that these innovations were actualized through collaborative social effort, through production and so forth, each of these innovations could be attributed to an individual mind. And thus, in this kind of setting, man for the first time was able to, to locate a direct connection between the very essence of continued human existence in general and the creative potentialities of an individual human mind. Therefore, the conception of man as man, as a scientific conception, first emerged in this period. The notion that the business of humanity, that humanity was distinguished by the fact that its members, its individual members, were capable of creative thinking. Creative thinking from individuals which was essential to the existence of the society as a whole. That is the essence of humanism. And therefore, society had to be concerned with, first of all, fostering those conditions which resulted in creative innovations by at least a certain proportion of the individuals of that society. 
fostering the conditions under which these inventions could be realized, which included fostering the education material conditions of life so that ordinary labor could employ this new technology, uh, use uh, the printed word, and so forth. So the whole humanistic conception developed from this. This is embodied in a concentrated way in the work of Kepler, who said this most hubristic of all things. He said, the universe as a whole is rational. Since the universe as a whole, and he took the solar system, the astronomical system as his frame of reference, as the empirical location of totality. So this whole is rational, therefore it can be comprehended by man, it can be comprehended by me. There's nothing God can do that I can't understand. Therefore I shall set out to examine this astronomical evidence, this astronomical totality, and I shall adduce from the totality as a totality. I shall adduce a fundamental law the fundamental law of the universe, which in a sense, in his own frame of reference, is precisely what he did. But the first effort to understand this creativity and where it comes from was Descartes, particularly the two theorems I cited. And I'll just go over them here in summary form because there's a fundamental point, fundamental psychological point among others to be made. Now the first one, the cogitor, I think, therefore I know. Uh, therefore I am. I don't have a blackboard, so I shall painstakingly recite this. <laughs> Can be represented symbo symbolo uh, symbolically in the following way. The symbolic form is, a, is, is, a, is an, it can be described as follows. Is that for every particular knowledge, perception, etc., which I have of the world about me, this knowledge does not occur as knowledge in and of itself, but occurs as a subject or predicate of a process of thinking. Without the activity of thinking, there is no knowledge. Therefore, if some knowledge in particular is real, then thinking is as real as anything else I know, and it is more real than anything else I know. Now thinking, the I think, is not in the same category as the perception of objects. I think is not an object, not in the ordinary sense. It is a subject for a category of predicates. Let me give a crude example of this, what I mean by this relationship. The concept number is not a number. I can describe all kinds of numbers, can give lists of all kinds of numbers, give rules for enumerating whole arrays of different kinds of numbers. And I can say that what I mean by all this is number. But number, as the category which includes all possible numbers, is not a number. Similarly, the category I think is not one of the elements of thought, of ordinary thought or ordinary knowledge. Now the second theorem is a theorem of perfection. Man at any given point has certain knowledge, knowledge which is practically demonstrated to be real and appropriate. However, through the development of knowledge, man's knowledge of any particular category of experience is improved so that his behavior becomes more appropriate. There is a change in his knowledge. Now this change is the effect, obviously, of creative innovations by individuals, socialized creative innovations by individuals. This knowledge is not the result, however, of merely existent individuals. You as an individual do not create new knowledge all by yourself. The problems which confront you are created by society. The culture from which you start in solving a problem is provided to you by society. The entire contemporary society is involved in the development of knowledge, directly or indirectly, but nonetheless necessarily involved. Preceding humanity. By this, to this, 
Descartes applies the concept perfection. That the process of thought in respect to knowledge is perfecting itself. There is progress, there is advancement in knowledge. Now here's where the gimmick comes. And here's where the problem arises. We could say that the subject of Descartes' theorem on perfection, that the subjects are the different knowledges which can be had in the same category of experience at successive stages of development. But that is not the case. The subject, the primary primitive phenomenon of perfection is not a particular form of knowledge. The primary primitive phenomenon is the process of change connecting two successive states of knowledge. That is, the existent thing is not, knowledge, is not knowledge in the ordinary sense. The existent thing is a process of change connecting two successive states of knowledge. That's the primary fact. Let's go back to the geometry example I gave earlier. When you develop a solution concept to a problem, you do not calculate a solution concept. It is incalculable. There is no logical procedure by which gestalts can be innovated in the human mind. Logic will not do it. Logic cannot permit you to discover anything. Discovery is based on accessing reason, self-conscious reason. And when you do this from the standpoint of the infantile ego of capitalist society, the beneficial re result you get from this, you call intuition. It's a process of reason, but you call it intuition. After you have, so to speak, intuited a satisfactory solution concept, then logic begins. You try to fit your new discovery consistently into the existing plenum of knowledge, of formal or logical knowledge. But the process of logically analyzing a concept to demonstrate its consistency with a body of knowledge is not the process of discovery. The process of discovery of knowledge is what we vulgarly call intuition. Same thing for Descartes' theorem. Knowledge cannot be logically defined. And to the extent that you logically compare two successive bits of knowledge, you have not gotten at the point of Descartes' theorem. What Descartes is concerned with is the process which we would vulgarly call intuition by which man progresses from one state of knowledge to another. Therefore, the empirical phenomenon to be considered is not the knowledge in particular, the primary primitive phenomenon, the empirical phenomenon, is the process of intuition by which two successive stages of knowledge are realized. Now, when, if you take that, what I said seriously, and don't simply take it from me as a plausible, edifying explanation, then most of you are in trouble. Because any of you who locate your identity primarily in the infantile ego are incapable of conceptualizing what I said. Because to the extent that your sense of identity is located in your ego, there is no available reference to you in your own mind by which you could locate something inside your head which you would deem corresponding to what I just described to you. That is, to the extent that you, have, you are in an ego state, it is impossible for you to find anything inside your head to correspond to the phenomenon I just identified. You can only isolate what I've said, take the words I've said, repeat them, paraphrase them, but you still will not understand what I've said. You can, so to speak, draw a circle around what I've said. Define what I say in terms of that I don't mean this and I don't mean that negating logical knowledge. But you cannot positively identify the concept which I have just identified. I'll just illustrate without going into it here. I presume we'll have a blackboard next week and I'll, I'll go through this again, with this particular concept. We know necessarily that the so-called physical universe is not made up of what is normally thought of as energy. That is, the universe is not made up of simple, homogeneous uh, quanta called energy. The physical universe is necessarily 
composed of a continuous process for which the term negentropy would have to replace would have to replace what we call energy this has been indirectly and implicitly recognized by a great number of people Einstein in his last years before his death uh, restated something which he'd stated before that this problem of defining a unified field will require a complete change in mathematics that is a, an essential superseding of existing mathematics by an entire new conception of mathematics the difficulty in doing that is not formal the difficulty is that the kinds of concepts required to solve those kinds of problems demand that the thinker who's trying to solve them be able to access in his own mind some category of mental behavior which corresponds to the phenomenon in the external world which he's trying to understand. Uh, to put it another way, if I ask most of you to identify what you know in any field, what will come out of you is a more or less a catalog of facts or things which are like fixed objects, facts, together with a set of rules or procedures by which you organize these facts. That is, your mind normally is capable of regarding as positive knowledge only two things. First of all, what can, we can regard as object images, discrete images. When you try to become conscious of something, you be normally become conscious of discrete images. You combine this with notions of what we call relationship, which you represent ordinarily by procedures or rules. You can define that kind of knowledge. That is logical knowledge or alienated, or better perhaps, anal knowledge. But ordinarily you have no referent in your mind for conceptualizing directly and deliberately process concepts. I give just a, a list of, of cases, historical cases. Spinoza uh, attempted to define this and did, uh, to a certain extent, successfully define this notion of continuous process and did that specifically in his ethics. Joseph Schelling attempted to understand this, that is Joseph Schelling tried to conceptualize a universe which was continuous as opposed to a universe made up of discrete particles. But he could conceive of only a linear continuity, that is like a homogeneous straight lines, homogeneous sheets and so forth. He could not conceptualize a continuity which was self-changing. That is, when you think of something continuous line, you say, well, it's a homogeneous line. You can cut it up, it's always the same. It's like butter, you keep slicing it. It's always butter. What you cannot conceptualize is a continuity which is self-reproducing, self-changing. A line which changes itself as it moves. Something which changes itself with respect to time and is not composed of parts as such, but which necessarily creates discrete things. Schelling couldn't. And therefore, because of this failure, Hegel said appropriately that Schelling's philosophy, his conception of infinity and continuity, was of a night in which all cows are black. That is, Schelling could not account for the existence of discrete objects in a continuous universe, and therefore he simply had to assume that there was this wonderful continuous essence which somehow permeated everything. And therefore everything was like a cows, as Hegel said, in a night, uh, uh, in a black night. Hegel did have such a conception. Feuerbach tried to get such a conception, but failed. Marx did develop such a conception. His notion of expanded reproduction, his, uh, specifically his uh, criticism of the physiocrats in the first part of theories of surplus value, is an, uh, is an illustration of the fact that Marx did have such a concept. The um, famous freedom necessity passage from section seven of volume three of Capital is another example of this, that Marx did have such a concept. That is, Marx was able to locate in his own mind a quality of the type which I've suggested that most of you could not find in your own mind, and Marx could conceptualize continuity. Well, that's, that's the essential point here, is that to perform deliberate creative mentation, to conceptualize processes as processes, that is, real positive processes. It is necessary for you as thinkers to 
free yourself of, or free yourself to a significant degree of the type of mental behavior, mental life, personality or character, which is given to you by bourgeois society. To free yourself from slavery to the infantile ego and the witch. If you do not, you cannot conceptualize these types of processes. Now this recently, just to indicate how real and concrete the problem is, we've had to deal with the problem of food. We are now confronted with dealing more intensively and programmatically with the question of energy on a worldwide scale, the same way we've dealt with food. But we have terrible problems, even within the Labor Committee, in effecting an understanding of the positive connection between this food campaign on the energy business and other kinds of political work. People will say, well, we have a food campaign, or we have an energy campaign, or we have an anti-slave labor campaign, or we have an election campaign, or we're doing contact work. It, yeah, this kind of fragmentation in which the, there is no understanding of the direct connection, the integral relationship between the food campaign and all other work. The problem here is of the same type is that what does the food campaign involve, conceptually? It involves communicating to a working person a different sense of personal identity than he's experienced heretofore in his life, except perhaps when he was two or three years old. Since then, he's lost entirely this conception of identity. Instead of seeing himself as an isolated, heteronomic individual who, if he gets enough money, will be able to get food, and therefore sees food simply as a matter of how much money he has and sees how much money he has as the social status of his position in life and so forth. Instead of seeing that, he now has to see the production of food, his food, as being willfully determined on a worldwide scale by an interrelated network of productions which involves most of the people in the world directly or indirectly. Therefore, he has to see his situation and his existence in a new way. He has to see himself not as an isolated individual against the world and against nature, but he has to conceptualize himself as a Spinozan person. He has to con conceptualize himself as in positive relationship to the rest of his class on a world scale. Has to think in terms. Well, obviously an individual who thinks like that cannot be a trade union chauvinist, cannot be a black nationalist, cannot be heteronomic in any other sense. An individual who understands the food program, really, is a revolutionary socialist. He's got to be. Therefore, what's the dichotomy between this and any other kind of work? It's the most sophisticated, most direct kind of political education imaginable. Well, there are some problems that come up, and I'll just identify what the problems are. And you find them among workers. We reported one in Solidarity a couple of weeks ago. You go up to a man, a worker, discuss food with him. He says, well, I don't know. My wife takes care of that. But I'm worried about it. But my wife takes care of that. Total alienation. He assumes that food is somehow something magical that his mother and wife provide for him. He gives his mother or his wife money, and she provides him food. It's a magical relationship. You start to discuss how food is produced, how he's going to get it, and he's blocked. But even among us, we find the same problem. We find difficulty in conceptualizing this kind of relationship. Well, the way Eric and others have laid this out, even so far, you can see that what the production of food involves. It's not a simple matter of having a fixed technology of food production, having enough people work at it. The problem is we have to develop new technologies and we'll continue to have to develop new technologies to meet human food requirements. So the question of a food program is not a package of technologies and recipes like a production program. That's only the beginning. But once you start that production program, you have to recognize that with existing technology, without new technologies, there won't still be enough food to meet the requirements that we have for the human race as a whole. Therefore, to meet the requirements of man as he exists today, we will have to increase technology 
And as we increase technology, we'll find new barriers. We'll have to increase technology still further to raise the human standard of living higher and to reduce the total amount of human effort required to produce food itself. That is, to reduce the ratio of effort just to find enough to, to eat. Therefore, this is the kind of process which people can get at algebraically by piece by piece, step by step methods. But when they attempt to conceptualize this as a process directly, they find themselves blocked in it, both as a concept, and they find that there are relationships to their neurotic problems uh, which are connected to this. And that's exactly it. If we treat the fact that people have an infantile ego, which they haven't freed themselves of, that this ego is essentially under the control of a witch, who in, in Catholic theology is known as the Virgin Mary or the Whore of Babylon. They're both the same thing. Now, the, the Virgin Mary and the Whore of Babylon are the universal for the witch. If they could free them, if they were not subjected to this, then human beings would be able to operate on the basis of self-consciousness. Would Their self-consciousness would access this fundamental emotion willfully, and they would find that there's a direct correspondence between the basic content and form of this fundamental emotion and the types of processes that we have to conceptualize of the type I indicated. Therefore, the inability of any human being to be a creative genius, that inability is entirely neurotic. The only reason that any human being who is not physiologically traumatized, any biologically normal human being, the only reason that any such human being is not a creative genius is that he has severe neurotic problems. And the fundamental neurotic problem is bourgeois ideology itself, which is like a universal religion in respect to which people's private neuroses are like private religions, which they have in addition to the universal religion. The way in which we're going to approach this in the organization and outside is this. First of all, we are producing a series of articles, some of which I'm writing, which will explicate the process uh, almost by a case study method. And the first article, Beyond Psychoanalysis, outlined the background to the uh, approach. And the second article, which is appearing in this month's campaigner, is the sexual impotence of the Puerto Rican Socialist Party. It's a case study of a particular kind of problem, why Latin American revolutionaries are impotent, in particular, which is merely a, an exemplary case for a problem which is rather pervasive throughout capitalist society. The case of the macho or the papagallo is only a more acute form of the sexual impotence which is commonplace throughout capitalist society. Uh, in the December and January campaigner, there's a case study of Feuerbach, which in addition to dealing with his systematic problems, uh, locates the root of his difficulty in a neurotic problem which is very evident in the contents of the essence of Christianity itself. That is, Feuerbach himself comes right out and details his neurotic problem for you in the pages of the essence of Christianity, which is a way of getting at the relationship between uh, these neurotic problems and the general problems of religious belief as the... Uh, conscious reflection of the general uh, neurosis of capitalist society, that is Christianity. Beyond that, we are doing a study of the uh, cult of Trotskyism as a exemplary case of, of sexual impotence in the form of a political movement. Uh, I will deal uh, in a published article subsequently with the case of R.D. Lang, who is, whose blunders in this uh, respect are most interesting. Uh, precisely because Lang is a clinical worker, and therefore, even though his interpretation of his evidence is uh, wrong, and his uh, procedures are worse than wrong, uh, nonetheless, uh, Lang is clinical, and therefore, his his material is uh, has some merit uh, for treatment, as opposed to uh, Cretans such as uh, uh, Althusser, who is also part of the pro-insanity movement among structuralists and existentialists in Europe. Well, that's quite serious. There is a pro-insanity movement. Uh, coming out of the structuralists in France and others in England. Uh, for, uh, this is, this is uh, understandable from the standpoint of French, uh, the French form of the problem. Uh, Camus expresses it perfectly in his idea that the world is absurd. Uh, this is also expressed by Foucault in his uh, book on folly, 
uh, about 15 years ago. And recently, uh, in the case of the clinical schizophrenic Althusser, uh, these and others are pushing a movement which is advocating insanity. Uh, in, some, uh, they are, in their own cases, they've succeeded. We'll also uh, do a study of some of the last period of Malcolm X, which is most instructive. Um, in his last period, what, what he was doing in his addresses, particularly at the uh, uh, auditorium uptown where we had the RIM conference, uh, was to actually use analytical methods, in a sense, to try to deal with the characteristic problems of the black uh, cultural nationalist to, to try to convert him into something else. In addition to that, we are doing a considerable amount of clinical work, as much as the handful of qualified people available can handle, and therefore it's limited. But uh, as this uh, work progresses, uh, because it intersects our general political work, the results of the work with a few is being transmitted to more in two ways. First of all, by uh, making the results of the uh, findings available. And another aspect of this, which I'll get into in the next few weeks more intensely, the reason we're able to do certain things in clinical work within the Labor Committee with success where we could not do, get the same success outside is that in order to, obviously in order to transfer the sense of identity to the self-conscious self from the ego, it's necessary that the self-conscious self have the uh, objective uh, perspective on identity which corresponds to what it's trying to reach. You say, I wish to become a self-conscious person. Well, to be a self-conscious person, to, to make that convincing to yourself psychologically, you have to organize your life to act in a self-conscious way. But to act in a self-conscious way, as we shall indicate, to act in a self-conscious way means to act as a human being, a self-conscious human being, which means you take the existence of future humanity as the essential criterion for your own existence. That is, the criterion of your own existence is to develop yourself, to express as activity those kind of acts which are necessary to ensure the future existence of humanity as a whole. Now, unless the individual is actually committed to acting in that way. It is impossible for him to tell himself that he is becoming a self-conscious human being. You cannot become self-conscious if you say, I want to improve uh, my mental state so that I can have a better relationship with my girlfriend. That won't work. That's not a self-conscious relationship. Your sense of identity is not self-conscious then. So therefore, it's only among people who are politically committed, who locate the very meaning of their lives and the criterion of every day of their lives in developing themselves and in acting for the furtherance of the future existence of humanity, only among such people is it possible to actually effect systematically progress from this infantile alienated ego state to a self-conscious self. Therefore, what we can do within the Labor Committee, particularly among the most committed people in dealing with this problem, is something we could not do, we could not replicate with John Doe and Jane Doe from the street, who said, help me with my psychological problems. It couldn't be done. They have not accepted the task-oriented precondition of really making a breakthrough. In such a case, we'd say, well, go to any psychoanalyst, they charge various rates, and they will probably do a fairly good job for you. We can't do anything more for you. We can only do something for ourselves to the extent that we are applying this knowledge on the basis of this special leverage, this tool, this political commitment. And it, it's, it, there's a corollary to that. Is the reason we have to do this, this is not simply something to improve our functioning. We have to do this because we find among ourselves extraordinarily gifted people who are unable to mobilize the resources they have to do the acts which they want to do. Someone says, I want to understand this. I want to teach a class to these workers. I have to work with these kids in RIM. 
Well, this individual has all the essential mental gifts, that is, all the culture, the ability to handle the elements of culture, the dedication and so forth to do that job, but can't do it competently. Why? Because it can't control these kinds of processes. Now, this is particularly significant in dealing with workers generally and in dealing with the youth in RIM. These youth have terrible problems. If you can't cope, if you can't develop insight into the relationship between their emotional problems and their problems in life generally, you can't deal with them. You can only deal at them and hope that some of it sticks by luck or by accident. Every worker in general, every typical worker who is drawn into neuro, drawn into activity, is going to usually have a problem with his wife. The minute he tries to be politically committed. If you can't understand his problem, and if you can't, haven't got the competence to begin helping him free his wife from her oppression, her self-induced oppression, then you can't build a movement among workers that's worth anything. In organizing masses of people, you depend upon precisely the qualities which are referred. To be an effective mass organizer means to become, at least to some degree, self-conscious. To be able to locate your identity in larger masses and in terms of the long-term process, the future of humanity, rather than the immediate situation. You cannot operate as an effective political organizer if you are controlled by the opinion, or what you imagine to be the opinion of you, by the people among whom you're acting. If you're influenced by public opinion, in the short term at all, if you're influenced, if that controls your judgment, then you're no good as an organizer. If you say, well, people don't like us if we do this. If that controls your judgment, you're no good as an organizer. That's your ego saying, I've got to get my goodies. I've got to be petted. I've got to be liked. Or I can't function. If people, if people give me funny looks, I, I can't work. But that's typical of people. You get the typical organizer among our own members. Knows perfectly well what he wants to do. He starts to speak before a group of four or five people and something happens to his mind. Something gets turned off. And where there was a clear conception a moment before, there's just fMRI. The thoughts, fragmented thoughts come buzzing about. The various kinds of feelings and emotions, conflicting emotions come buzzing about. He gets himself together with rage and tries to express a formal argument for his case, which is really a banalized, bodlerized version of our politics, which he's saying because he got up to speak. But before he got up to speak, he had a clear conception of what he wanted to say. But the minute he gets up to speak, his mind gets turned off. He can't think clearly. Typical work, a typical member confronts a couple of workers. The workers show a little hostility or resentment or begin to exhibit their neuroses. A moment before, that member was perfectly clear on what he wanted to say to the worker. Confronted with this kind of emotional display or reaction of the worker, the work, this member's mind gets turned off. He goes through a one or several rituals and there's no effective communication between him and that worker. So we're compelled to deal with this problem among a leading strata in particular of our membership because if we don't, we cannot fulfill the task to which we're committed or only a handful will do it. And the great problem which relates to what I said in the beginning, even from the standpoint of a revolutionary organization, in socialist movements in the past, and this is the mystery of the Bolshevik Revolution, in a sense. Entire mass-based organizations at best had a handful of individuals in them who are capable of doing thinking and organizing. The majority of members of so-called socialist organizations were merely errand boys of one sort or another working around a handful of actually qualified leaders. That's the mystery of the Bolshevik Revolution. You take Lenin and a handful of other individuals and the rest of the Bolshevik party from the standpoint of political quality was absolute crap. Look at Zinovia, a totally bumbling fool. Kamenev, an absolute fool. Stalin, a degenerate Philistine lout whose quality, qualities are essentially those of a well-organized stick-up man. <laughs> no, this is true. This is true, and this was recognized among the Bolshevik leaders. There were a handful of qualified leaders. You cannot make a socialist transformation in an advanced country with that kind of organization. Unless 
You're engaged in a process where you're taking ordinary committed people and enabling them to liberate that potentiality within themselves to become effective organizers. You have not got the striking force necessary to organize workers. Every time we meet a group of workers at a plant gate or elsewhere, there's a critical opportunity. And if in the follow-up, contact and follow-up of those workers at those plants, we had qualified cadres, that is people who are intellectually developed, along the lines I'm indicating, we would not miss those opportunities. But because our members are only an approximation of what they themselves intend to become, they make the contact and they goof it up. Not because they don't understand workers, that's bunk. Not because they don't wear a leather jacket. Not because they don't carry a lunch pail. That's not their problem. The problem is not they're not proletarianized. The problem is that they're not able to mobilize what physiologically is their potential for creative intelligence. They're not able to overcome their own ego reactions to rise above the interpersonal ego situation to look into the worker, try to understand what's going on inside him, and try to locate within him that to which they have to address themselves. So unless we do this, there's no hope, there's no hope for the human race. Okay, well I think, uh, we'll get some questions. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll call on people and they can then proceed to the mic. Uh, Questions and comments, please. Are there any? Ah, I see one in the back, yes. Huh. Is he the only one? The addition of myself, I've been doing some research into uh, patient uh, ideology, patient, and as it stands out, patient. Uh, social structure, childhood matters. And in particular, I was uh, reading a CIA title book written in this country on Haiti uh, a few years ago, and quite impressed at the degree of sophistication of this ugly group of scholars who had uh, written them into uh, psychic, natural psychiatric characteristics in Haiti. Now, what I would like to, uh, up to the point where, where the psychiatrist, or the, the, the man writing the book, was unable to, uh, was unable to conceptualize what, what he called a, uh, a jump between this warm, uh, physically nourishing infantile period and suddenly the, uh, the patient individual being thrown into a hostile outside world, which, which he couldn't deal with. In particular, we, we often couldn't conceptualize this idea of, of development as opposed to a clarification of the negation idea. Now, the, the question is this. Could you, could you discuss the, 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 what the problems are that the most sophisticated bourgeois scholars on this subject are capable of reaching and comparing that with also well, first of all, let me, let me say one thing. I don't think the project's a very good one. First of all, uh, you, you'll see that more clearly when you read the PSP article and think about it, and think about how it was put together. Is that to get at the mental life of any section, the subculture of culture in humanity, requires certain qualifications beforehand. And you're not going to get, you're not going to get the, uh, reliable results unless you bring those qualifications beforehand to the work. It might seem that uh, good rational study and so forth and comparison of of sources on method would get the result. It doesn't. Because in any kind of, of psychological study, what the investigator is working with is his own mental processes. 
and what he cannot confront and locate within himself, he cannot see. That is, if there are aspects of one's own nature from which one is blocked, or if you cannot gain access when you need it to, in a sense, empathize with the inner mental state of the people you're investigating, you're going to come up with, with very bad blunders. It's, it's commonplace. Uh, I, I want to, at this point, just to be sure, I want to stress the fact that as a leader of a political organization, the fact that I, with a few others, am undertaking this kind of work does not mean that I'm advocating in any sense the passing out of a license to practice psychoanalysis to a bunch of laymen, either from the standpoint of uh, clinical work, which can be absolutely deadly, is a person who is blocked, running around trying to uh, lead group sessions or individual counseling is a menace, an absolute menace. And it's only less dangerous, because it will probably end up as largely a waste of time, to attempt to investigate a culture. I mean, to take, I'll just cite this PSP thing. Why was I able to put this question of the PSP together? Because I had the clinical experience with actual cases dealing with this kind of phenomenon in general to be able to understand in detail the inner life of the Latin American. With clinical qualifications. I could not possibly, from textbook knowledge, or college classroom education, or degree in psychology or any of this other crap, I could not possibly have competently attacked that problem. You have to be able to see and feel inside the people you're analyzing. If you have not gone through the confrontation in which you yourself have gone through what we call depth analysis. That is where this fundamental emotion has been brought up. Where you've had your own, your, your sense the first time of your own depth inside yourself. And until you've learned to cope with that, when that's no longer dangerous to you, when you don't faint, vomit, choke up, or some, the usual phenomena, when this starts, or jump into a baptistry, uh, honestly, only then can you do any analysis, because you never know. I never know. I generally get a hint of when it's coming on. But I will never know in advance when someone says, I want to talk with you. I will never know that within two or three hours, if I say I'm going to talk with you for two hours, I don't know that in the course of that time, this person is going really brought up something, and that I've got to deal with, with this kind of crisis with that individual. If I don't know what I'm doing, if I don't know what this emotion is, how it behaves, if I don't understand how their mind works, I'm as dangerous to them as a plumber. Now, let me, let me suggest, as I say, I qualify this. Under no cases, in my view, should people be attempting to launch projects in the psychology of a population until they are qualified to do individual analytical work. Which means, having gone through depth analysis, having recognized the roots of your own sexual impotence, recognize the problems of formalism and all the other uh, correlatives. There are things that can be done, and one of, the one of the efforts we make is to chop out from a few of us who are able to get at the basic problems, is to chop out pieces which people can work on. For I'll give just one example, or two examples, uh, two kinds of examples of what we're doing that fills those qualifications. For example, the case of the German medical student we have a number of our members in Germany, including some of the medical students and physicians themselves, who are qualified and who are therefore are continuing the preliminary analysis that we did with a population of these students to develop the complete clinical case on what is the psychopathology of the German medical examination system. That's going to be published. Right? These people are qualified. They've gone through some all the way down the bottom. They've gone through depth analysis. And they're qualified to do this kind of work. Some of them are, are matured clinicians. In Italy, we're doing a, an article on the case of Antonio Gramsci. Now, Gramsci 
which includes a study of Gramsci and of the Socialist Party Executive Committee of the 1919 to 1922 period. The minutes of these meetings are published. In the proceedings of the Socialist Party of Italy during the period of the general strikes in 1919 to 2021, the minutes of these meetings are the most ugly display of political impotence you ever saw outside the Spartacus League. Here's a general strike as a revolution. And these revolutionary leaders, these clowns, are sitting at meeting after meeting trying to pass the buck on ongoing executive responsibilities for activities, including Gramsci himself. Now in the case of Gramsci, who had a hideous mother, a hideous childhood, he was hung up from a ceiling on a board to try to straighten out his back. You know, like crucified as a kid, tortured as a child. All it comes from Sardinia, a hideous place to come from. I mean, in terms of the circumstances, it, it's backwardness, you know, precedence. Well, the person who's doing this principally, along with others, are people who've gone through depth analysis. They're qualified to, to work on the case of Antonio Gramsci. Other people are qualified to do peripheral work. Then we have other projects which are being done in Europe and being done here, which are on specific problems of epistemology. What we do in this case is for people who have not gone through that, have not qualified in the broader sense, but who have special qualifications.